Communist, fascist. You don't like America, you should just leave. Everybody just calm down. Death to the new world order. Death to the new world order. And as the irrationality of the audience grew, shocked and confused, suddenly the narrator suffered a fatal heart attack. And the seemingly communist propaganda film was no more. You know, I've said that sort of thing to people in think tank type of situations. And, uh, you know, these Club of Rome types and so forth. Marxist. What Marxist? Where did that come from? You know, they just, they got this icon they hold on to. It's their holy grail. Uh, and it's such an easy one, you know. People ask if I'm a socialist or a communist or a capitalist, and I say, I'm none of the above, and why do you, th why do you think that those are the only options? All of those political constructs were created by writers who assumed that we lived on a planet of infinite resources. Not a one of those political philosophies even con contemplates that there might be a shortage of anything. I believe that communism, socialism, free enterprise, fascism are part of social evolution. That you can't take a giant step from one culture to another, but they're in between systems. Before there's any ism, we've got a life ground. And the life ground is, as I just described most easily, it's all the conditions required to take your next breath. And that involves the air you breathe, the water you get, the safety you have, the education you can access. All these things that we share and use and that, that no life in any culture can do without. So we've got to reset down to the life ground. And the life ground is no longer any ism. It's life value analysis. It's simply a matter of historical fact that the dominant intellectual culture of any particular society reflects the interest of the dominant group in that society. Uh, in a slave-owning society, the beliefs about human beings and human rights and so on will reflect the needs of the slave owners. In a society which again is based on the power of uh, certain people to control and profit from the lives and uh, work of millions of others, the dominant intellectual culture will reflect the needs of, of the dominant group. And so that if you look across the board, the ideas that pervade psychology and uh, sociology and history and political economy and political science fundamentally reflect certain elite interests and the academics who question that too much uh, tend to get shunted to the side or to be seen as sort of radicals. The dominant values of a culture tend to support and perpetuate what is rewarded by that culture. And in a society where success and status is measured by material wealth, not social contribution, it is easy to see why the state of the world is what it is today. We are dealing with a value system disorder completely denatured, where the priority of personal and social health have become secondary to the detrimental notions of artificial wealth and limitless growth. And like a virus, this disorder now permeates every facet of government, news media, entertainment, and even academia. And built into its structure are mechanisms of protection from anything that might interfere. Disciples of the monetary market religion, the self-appointed guardians of the status quo, constantly seek out ways to avoid any form of thought which might interfere with their beliefs, the most common of which are projected dualities. If you are not a Republican, you must be a Democrat. If you are not a Christian, you might be a Satanist. And if you feel society can be greatly improved to consider perhaps, I don't know, taking care of everyone, you're just a utopianist. And the most insidious of them all, if you are not for the free market, you must be against freedom itself. I'm a believer in freedom. Every time you hear the word freedom being said anywhere or government interference said anywhere, it means decoded, blocking maximization of turning money into more money for private money possessors. That's it. Every other thing they'll say, oh, we need more commodities for people, oh, this is a, a, a freedom uh, against tyranny and so forth. Every time you see it, you can decode it, 
down to that. And I think you'll find a one-to-one -one correlation with every time they use it. And this is the sense in which we might call it's a syntax, a governing syntax of understanding and of value so that it governs beneath their own recognition of it. So they may not say, oh, I didn't mean that at all, but in fact, that's what they do. Just like you may speak a grammar, and you have rules of grammar you follow without recognizing what the rules are. And so what we have is what I call the ruling value syntax that underlies this. So every time they use these words, government interference, lack of freedom, or freedom, or uh, progress, or development, you can decode them all to come back to mean that. Of course, when you hear the word freedom, it tends to be in the same sentence with something called democracy. It's fascinating how people today seem to believe that they actually have a relevant influence on what their government does forgetting that the very nature of our system offers everything for sale. The only vote that counts is the monetary vote, and it doesn't matter how much any activist yells about ethics or accountability. In a market system, every politician, every legislation, and hence every government is for sale. And even with the $20 trillion bank bailout starting in 2007, an amount of money which could have changed, say, the global energy infrastructure to fully renewable methods, instead going to a series of institutions that literally do nothing to help society, institutions that could be removed tomorrow with no recourse, the blind conditioning that politics and politicians exist for the public well-being still continues. The fact is, politics is a business, no different than any other in a market system, and they care about their self-interest before anything else. I don't really, honestly, deep down believe in political action. I think the system contracts and expands as it wants to. It accommodates these changes. I think the civil rights movement was an accommodation on the part of those who own the country. I think they see where their self-interest lies. They see a certain amount of freedom seems good, an illusion of liberty. Give these people a voting day every year so that they'll have the illusion of meaningless choice. Meaningless choice that we go like slaves and say, oh, I voted. The limits of debate in this country are established before the debate even begins, and everyone else is marginalized. They're made to seem either to be communists or was some sort of disloyal person. A kook, there's a word, and now it's conspiracy. Say, they've made that. Some that should not be even entertained for a minute that powerful people might get together and have a plan doesn't happen you're a kook you're a conspiracy buff and of all the mechanisms of defense of this system there are two that repeatedly come up the first is this idea that the system has been the cause of the material progress we have seen on this planet well no there are basically two root causes which have created the increased so-called wealth and population growth we see today. One, the exponential advancement of production technology, hence scientific ingenuity. And two, the initial discovery of abundant hydrocarbon energy, which is currently the foundation of the entire socioeconomic system. The free market, capitalist, monetary market system, whatever you want to call it, has done nothing but ride the wave of these advents with a distorted incentive system and a haphazard, grossly unequal method of utilizing and distributing those fruits. The second defense is a belligerent social bias generated from years of propaganda, which sees any other social system as a route to so-called tyranny with various name droppings of Stalin, Mao, Hitler, and the death tolls they generated. Well, as despotic as these men might have been, along with the societal approaches they perpetuated, when it comes to the game of death, when it comes to the systematic daily mass murder of human beings, nothing in history compares to what we have today. Famines throughout at least the last century of our history have not been caused by a lack of food. They've been caused by relative poverty. The economic resources were so inequitably distributed that the poor simply didn't have enough money with which to buy the food that would have been available if they could have afforded to pay for it. That would be an example of structural violence. Another example 
in Africa and some other areas, but I'll, I'll particularly focus on Africa, tens of millions of people are dying of AIDS. Why are they dying? It's not because we don't know how to treat AIDS. We have, you know, millions of people in the, in the wealthy countries are getting along remarkably well because they have the medicines that will treat it. The people in Africa who are dying of AIDS are not dying because of the HIV virus. They're dying because they don't have the money with which to pay for the drugs that would keep them alive. Gandhi saw this. He said the deadliest form of violence is poverty. And that's absolutely right. Poverty kills far more people than all the wars in history, more people than all the murderers in history, more than all the suicides in history. Not only does structural violence kill more people than all the behavioral violence put together, structural violence is also the main cause of behavioral violence. Oil is the foundation of and that is present throughout the edifice of human civilization. There are 10 calories of hydrocarbon energy, oil and natural gas, and every calorie of food you and I eat in the industrialized world. Fertilizers are made from natural gas. Pesticides are made from oil. You drive oil-powered machines to plant, plow, irrigate, harvest, transport, package. You wrap the food in plastic, that's oil. All plastic is oil. There are seven gallons of oil in every tire. Oil is everywhere. It's ubiquitous. And it's only because of oil that there are seven billion people, or almost seven billion people, on this planet right now. The arrival of this cheap, easy energy, which is equivalent, by the way, to billions of slaves working around the clock, uh, changed the world in such a radical way over the last century. And the population has gone up 10 times. But by 2050, oil supply is able to support less than half the present world's population in their present way of life. So the scale of adjustment to live differently is just enormous. The world is now using six barrels of oil for every barrel it finds. Five years ago it was using four barrels of oil for every barrel it finds. A year from now it's going to be using eight barrels of oil for every barrel it finds. What's disturbing to me is the lack of any real effort from governments worldwide or industry leaders worldwide to do something different. I mean, we have these sort of attempts to build more wind power and to, to maybe do something with tide. We've got attempts to make our cars a little bit more um, efficient. But there's nothing which really looks like a revolution coming along. These are, these are all pretty minor. And that, I think, is pretty frightening. And the governments who are driven by these economists who don't really appreciate what we're talking about are trying to stimulate consumerism to restore past prosperity in the hope that they can restore the past. They're printing yet more money lacking any collateral at all. So if, if the economy improves and recovers and growth, famous growth comes back, it'll only be short-lived because within a short period of time, counted in months rather than years, it'll hit the supply barrier again. There'll be another price shock and a deeper recession. So I think we go into a series of vicious circles. So you have the economic growth going up, price spike, everything shuts down, that's where we are now. Then it starts to come up again. But what we have now is this, is this area where there's, there's no more ability to produce cheap energy. We're at the peak. We're on the downslope of oil production. No way you're going to get any more out of the ground uh, any faster, uh, which means that things shut down the price of oil drops, which it did in the early 2009, but then as you have an ersatz so-called recovery, the price of oil starts to come back. It's recently been hovering around $80 a barrel, and, and what we see is at $80 a barrel now, with the economic and financial collapse, people are having a hard time affording that. World oil production uh, right now is about 86 million barrels a day. Over 10 years, you're looking at roughly 40, 40 million barrels a day having to be replaced. There's nothing around which can come even within a 1% of meeting that sort of demand. If we don't do something pretty quickly, there's going to be a huge energy deficiency. I think the big mistake is in not recognizing um, a decade or so ago 
that an effort, a concerted effort, needed to be made to develop these sustainable forms of energy. I think that's something our grandchildren will look back on with uh, total uh, disbelief. You people knew that you were dealing with a finite commodity.